The views and opinions of this broadcast do not reflect the views and opinions of Armed Media, Who New Productions and its affiliates. Enjoy the show. everyone uh, welcome to all you can eat it's the podcast about deliciousness if it's uh, wednesday just after eight uh, on the east coast you know you can find me uh, here this is your host rob rosenthal episode number uh, 44 of the uh, podcast here on uh, january the 30th welcome everybody welcome back to those of you who've been before and a special hello uh, to those of you tuning in for the first time um you know, tonight I'm excited about a couple of things. Number one is that uh, this coming uh, Sunday, as most of you know, is the uh, Super Bowl. Am I excited about the Super Bowl um, in the overall sense? Uh, here's the uh, here's the here's the real deal on that. I'm I'm broadcasting or podcasting, I should say, to you live uh, from uh, New York, New York, uh, where it's ice cold. Uh, and uh, and here's the situation. I got a Super Bowl on Sunday, and it's going to be New England playing against Los Angeles. Now, as a as a New Yorker, this is um, <clears throat> tantamount to an, a nightmare. I mean, I can't actually think of two teams that I would r- rather see less uh, in, in the Super Bowl. <clears throat> but uh, my excitement uh, stems from the fact uh, that it turns out that we consume more food on Super Bowl Sunday than on any other day of the year, with the exception of uh, Thanksgiving, of course. So, tonight's show, uh, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about food, especially as it relates to the, uh, the Super Bowl. And that includes, by the way, uh, you know, a combination of kind of uh, recipes for those of us that are uh, making, uh, or bringing to a party. Uh, it, I, I have some information on kind of what are the most uh, uh, popular, most uh, searched uh, uh, foods, uh, who can deliver them to you, uh, what's available over there. What is it, the Mercedes-Benz uh, uh, Stadium in Atlanta? I have the whole uh, uh, piece on, uh, you know, for the eighty or 100,000 going to the game. I know exactly what they're serving there and, and how, how good it is. And I'm also excited because tonight we're going to have a conversation with a guy uh, whose uh, name is uh, uh, Brent Brent uh, Hawking. Now, Mr. Uh, Hawking, who is on uh, the line with me, is uh, is an entrepreneur in the area of uh, spirits. So we're going to talk with uh, Brent about uh, De Leon uh, tequila, uh, Virginia Black American uh, whiskey, and his uh, newest uh, Mud Selection Champagne. Uh, that he is uh, producing and distributing in partnership with a guy named Drake. So anyway, excited about that. We're going to get on with uh, Brent in a minute, maybe even before a minute. Hey, I'll tell you what, um, because I've I've laid everybody out uh, in terms of what we want to do tonight. So we have a lot of uh, Super Bowl talk. Oh, by the way, here's the other thing I wanted to say. Um, We're on episode 44. I don't believe we've had one episode out of 44 that has not had some... Uh, technical screw up. And that's, uh, frankly, I'm okay with that. That seems to be part of the nature of the show. That said, I offer you folks, if you're interested, a telephone number to call in because you might have a question. The number is 800-508-5431. And again, it's me here, Rob, on All You Can Eat, on the line with uh, Brent uh, Hawking. Brent, are you there? I'm here, Rob. Ha! Well, look at that. Already, we are way ahead uh, of the uh, of the protocol in terms of um, things technical because you're you're there and you sound good, Brent. Uh, tell everybody where are we talking to you from? Where are you actually seated at the moment? Uh, we're live here from my office uh, and showroom here in West Hollywood, California. West Hollywood, California. Now I should point out to you, just as the coincidence, that my brother is a resident of West Hollywood for I would say the past thirty years, so I know the neighborhood very well. I'm going to tell you, Brent, because you don't talk about food, 
that I, when I visit my brother, because I'm out there, you, you know, generally a couple, three times a year, the first thing that we do in the morning uh, is we pop over to uh, King's Road, and uh, and that's where we drink our coffee. You, nice. You know, this, are you, you at uh, are you at Hugo's there on King's Road? Or? Well, uh, you, you know, uh, sure, but I'm just telling you that the coffee protocol the day begins over at King's Road, and um, which I what, what is it like? What, it's not uh, was it Beverly Boulevard or West Third? I, I forget. Uh, you, you know, because he, he's his, he's right in the middle of those two. But we start the day over there with coffee, which is always fun because there's like a it's kind of like a regular uh, regular crowd trickles in. So you're sitting with people that he sits with every single day of his life. Anyway, it's a long, long way around saying that I know the neighborhood where uh, Brent, uh, uh, before we get into what it is that you do, where did you uh, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Compton, California. Um, so and I live in Malibu now. Sweet. So you're a, you know, you're a local product. And um, just tell me, tell me this about growing up. Here's what I want to know. I can't uh, pretend to know anything more about Compton than what a guy, you know, might see in the in the press or in the movies. What what uh, what are some of the recollections you have about growing up there uh, in general? But I mean, especially when it comes to kind of like food and, and drink, what are you what are your recollections from that part of the world? Um. I thought it was great. Uh, this was Compton in the seventies and, um, you know, uh, I thought it was a beautiful way to grow up and, and, um, I wasn't, uh, privileged to have a great food and wine background. Then I was also not 21 in those years. And, uh, uh, and my father was a preacher, so there was no alcohol anywhere to be seen. And, um, <laughs> I love that. Uh, I love that, by the way, because that's going to lead me to our next question. But I guess my question is more about, like, do you, did you, were you into f- kind of food at all growing up? You know, I, I don't think I was. Um, you know, I was very fond of Arby's at the time. <laughs> uh, it's good. <laughs> but that's about as far as it went. But uh, as I started to drink um, later in life, uh, I became quite uh, passionate about both food and wine. Okay. Now, so two things I want to tell you to get us started here this evening. One is that I saw, I, I happened to have seen a T-shirt recently, and I instantly fell in love with it. And the T-shirt reads, straight out of Comte. Uh, Comte being like a French, uh, a French cheese. I'm, I'm only mentioning that because obviously it's a play on, you know, straight out of Comte. Yeah. The, the other thing I think that you should know is that because we start the, uh, the show here at, uh, at eight o'clock on the East Coast, you know, I always encourage people to, if they're listening live, to kind of grab themselves a cocktail. And tonight in your honor, my friend, I'm drinking tequila. Now I'm not going to bullshit you. I, I happen not to be drinking a De Leon. Uh, but I, at least I'm drinking tequila. How, how did you, you, you were a guy, if I have this thing right, that was working for Bank of America as kind of a, a mortgage loan merchant guy. How did that transition into getting into the spirits business? How did you become an entrepreneur? I was, uh, yes, I was in the banking business, but, um, as I started to do very well in the banking business, you know, um, I hadn't really, looked into uh, the finer things in life and I started to uh, go to Vegas back in the early 90s and for the first time I started to drink and eat fine foods and wines and as I started to drink which was pretty much banned from me growing up right. um, I realized that I had an unbelievable palate that you know was uh, it, just a God-given palate where I can I can blind him in a room that scares people and, and it and it it just became a thing where I got very passionate very quickly about, wow, how, why does this one taste like this? And, and you know, why does this taste like this? And at some point, um, I decided that I needed to leave it behind and pursue this full time. Well, how did you go about doing that? What was the, what were the steps? What was the process to get you into the biz? Uh, the process was, um, I got married in 2005 and my wife said to me, uh, you're dying a slow death. 
in the banking business, you're designing your friends' homes for free, and you love alcohol, um, you need to do something else. Yes. And um, we packed up, moved to Malibu, and I began uh, a project uh, in tequila back in 07, of which I launched the original De Leon tequila in 09, and that's how it started. Nice. What to tell the folks uh, about De Leon? What What about that? Uh, what about that brand? How? What do you guys do? What makes it uh, interesting, different, better? Well, the, the original De Leon tequila. If you, if, if knowing something about my background now and the passion being in wine, right. I I went down and went to uh, tequila and started researching every one of the distilleries down there, which are called Fabricas, mm -hmm. and you realize that there's some allowable chemicals that you can do to make tequila. And I was really the first person that started to uh, age the tequilas in wine barrels. I was aging in Sautern wine barrels from the most sought-after regions in Bordeaux nice. 10 years before anyone else in the market caught on to it. So it, the barrel aging and natural flavor profiles have always been of paramount importance to me and in my production and branding style. Um, and uh, we created some very special products. In fact, one of my highest, I, my tequila back then in 09, I had my Blanco was $125 a bottle. Wow. And my Anejo that was aged 34 months in Chateau Diakem barrels was retailing at 825. So at the time, I'm not sure everybody was ready for tequila at that level. Um, and then in 2013, I sold to Diageo, and they in turn uh, uh, gave the brand to uh, Diddy, John Combs, yeah. and they took the brand in a different direction, and um, the rest is history, and I moved on. Well, that's, uh, that's quite a... That's quite a story. I, uh, and I, and I love that story. Having, uh, spent a little bit of time in that business, uh, myself, I used to do the advertising for Absolute when it was, um, in the days that it was still interesting. So you, you moved, uh, on, uh, from, uh, tequila. Tell me about the, um, about the, the whiskey brand. Well, when I sold the tequila, I uh, was at uh, a party and, and I was approached by Drake and, and he was a big fan of the original De Leon tequila and the level and the quality. And he said that he wanted to do something and I didn't think much of it, but they followed up and they came in and we developed a relationship and, and he, you know, his moniker, you know, forever has been the champagne poppy and, and he wanted to do a champagne. And I said, look, to do it right, because I will only do it on the highest of highest level, champagne, this is going to take years, man. And and true enough, uh, true to form, it took almost five years to bring it to market to do it right wow. um, and work with the family, make our own champagne. You know, we're not borrowing anything. And so in the meantime, I said, look, we should do a complimentary product so there's a spirit in the champagne and I told him that I felt like the whiskey space at the time in 13 was going to get very hot. And I felt like there was an opportunity for him to do something a little bit more unusual. And he certainly with the other competitors in his field, he didn't want to do a vodka and he didn't want to do a few things. So uh, this whiskey play was um, something we decided to come out with first and create a new uh, attractive product uh, in the whiskey space. Uh, the, the name of the, uh, tell everybody the name of the, um, of the whiskey and then, and the name of the, uh, the champagne. The name of the whiskey is Virginia Black Decadent American Whiskey. Nice. And the name, and the name of the champagne is Mod Selection. And, uh, uh Brent, they're both, uh, what's the availability? How would people, uh, experience them? Where would they buy them? Um, we are, we are, we are partners with Southern Wine and Spirits, um, that nice. handle all of our distribution in the United States and Canada. Nice. And, uh, you can pretty much order it throughout. Um, you can also order our champagne, you know, um, no matter where you are, you could go to wine.com and have the champagne delivered very quickly. 
Sweet. And is your uh, your partner Drake? Uh, you know, is he holding up his end of the deal there? Is he uh, working or is he uh, he's, is he out there playing? No, no, he's 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 doing great, and um, it, it's a great partnership, and we're. Um, we, we have a lot of things planned for this year, and uh, he's very excited about the Champagne and, and Virginia Black and, and the opportunities they're in. Um, it, it's great when they really love the product, but he's very proud of them and uh, excited to be there. You know what I say? It's God's plan, my friend. It's God's plan. Um, it is. Yes, it is. Hey, um, on, on a slightly – by the way uh, – uh, all right, you already okay. So you moved into the whiskey and the champagne. That's cool. Are you going to be your your? You, you know, I mean, I have friends. First of all, I I must say hello uh, to the the whole crowd up in the Boston uh, area because there's a a bunch of people up there that have a chance to listen to us live. So hello, all you guys, and good luck on uh, Sunday. And here I am on the phone with you at lo- uh, a a a. a not only a long time, kind of like a permanent uh, all time uh, Los Angeles native. Are you excited about the game? I'm very excited about the game. Uh, the Rams were in Anaheim back when I was young, right. and believe it or not, my dad used to do the chapels for the Rams, and I would get taken there because I was a young boy. So um, was sitting around there with Jack Youngblood and Rich Saul and Jackie Slater and. Vince Ferragamo and all the guys back when I was a young kid, so it was very impressionable back when they used to wear blue and gold. Nice. How are you feeling about uh, about Sunday? You're optimistic? You're realistic? What's your uh, prognostication? Oh, uh, you know, I, uh, I I love great games either way, but, um, you know, the, the line is what the line is. It'll be a very close game, I think, and I uh, look forward to seeing it. Let me ask you the more important question. While you're watching the game, what <laughs> what are you going to be drinking? Um, you know, I drink everything. Um, and I will be drinking the original De Leon. I will be drinking that. I will be drinking Virginia Black. Um, and I will be drinking Mod Selection Champagne, most definitely. <laughs> that's good. That's, that's perfect. And what's your uh, – since you became – more interested uh, in time uh, uh, in the whole kind of idea of food and good food, and you've traveled to Mexico and you've undoubtedly traveled to Europe. What's um, before we even talk about you know food in general? Uh, as far as Sunday, as far as the Super Bowl goes, you have any sense of what you're going to be eating? Oh, it's a good question. Um, in my world, it's likely meat. Uh, so I will um, I'll probably veer toward the New York steak route. Thank you for that. At least that New York has some play on Sunday, since we're not going to be in the game. Uh, you can enjoy, <laughs> enjoy a, a nice a nice New York steak. Um, uh, but it, uh, but in general, you know, I'm assuming uh, you, you know. Anytime I, I look, I, I I know a lot of people in the in the business and anytime you're in kind of like the spirits business or the wine or that kind of thing, you know, you do spend a lot of time around, around food. Do you also have an opportunity to kind of, uh, enjoy a good cuisine where, wherever you go? And, and if so, what do your, uh, what do you enjoy most? What's your kind of, what's your kind of food thrill or food pleasure? You know, I, uh, I'm a big fan of um, a lot of restaurants and a lot of types of food, Italian and, and, and steak. But um, I think, you know, some of my core go-to spots in, in West Hollywood and in, and in Beverly Hills, I, you know, Medeo has been uh, a favorite of mine for years, uh, which is an Italian spot. And right. Capo in Santa Monica. And um, just uh, quite a few spots in New York. I'm a John George fan. Okay. A lot of his meat, a lot of his spots in New York. Um, Del Posto is still one of my favorites. Yeah, good, nice. Okay, hey, let me um, let me ask you this: um, uh, what about kind of what do you think is the best advice that you've ever that you've ever been given? You know, as a as a as an independent, entrepreneurial, successful businessman. What do you think is the best advice you've ever been given, or or advice that you would uh, instead, uh, you know, turn 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 someone else on to if they wanted to kind of follow their passion? 
Well, I, I would say, you know, in in uh, there was a couple of things. One that is maybe somewhat obvious to people, but those failures that bum you out are so often lead to the bigger step for you that you almost have to thrive on the failure as if it was meant for something better for you to pursue mm. another direction. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, uh, I, I think that's something that you need to take heart ever, you know, whenever you're walking through, uh, situations that don't apparently seem to be working out uh, without, without fail. If you're continuing to be relentless, it's actually leading you to where you need to be going and you need to, you, you need to soak up that failure for what it, what it, what it does for you and how it can benefit you. You know, I have to confess to you that I love that. I think that that's a brilliant uh, insight and piece of advice. Cause I think that, you know, from what I can see in the world, a, a lot of people uh, kind of give up just as they're, just as they're at the closest point, And a lot of people, have the hardest time in dealing with the the obstacles and the failures as you would call them so i really i really appreciate uh, and value uh, what it is that you've said i think it's a combination of understanding that the failures are part of the learning process and you have to work through them and and learn from them and i think i heard you use the word persistence as well which turns out to be uh, when it comes to any kind of professional pursuit or that kind of thing, uh, persistence, determination, uh, stick to whatever you want to call it, uh, is easily uh, one of the most uh, vital ingredients to success. Would you? Would you agree? Yeah, the word I use was relentless. Yeah, and, that was uh, the word, right? Relentless. And it's, right. Certainly, it's certainly part of that, and um, I agree. That's very good. Well, all right. Um, I would say that that's excellent. I am glad uh, that we had this uh, chance uh, to uh, chat together and really appreciate your time. Before I uh, let you go on, tell the folks uh, where they where they can kind of look up. You know, where, where do you send people, for example, uh, on whether it's online or any kind of social uh, media account? Where where would people find out about uh, you, about the products, about the brands, etc.? Feel free. Yeah. Um... You know, for the champagne, you would go to modselectionchampagne.com. For Virginia Black, you would go to virginiablackwhiskey.com. And for information on my entire portfolio, you would go to the modselector.com. And that's selector with an ER at the end. And uh, you can find out all about what we do and how we do it. And, um, the intricate process and the detail that we put into it. Lovely. Perfect. Thank you for, uh, for spending the time. Uh, good luck with the brand, uh, and, uh, and all good things. So appreciate your uh, hanging out with us and, uh, and continued good luck and good luck tomorrow, by the way. Uh, you know, again, as I said from the very beginning, if we, if there were a way that both teams could lose, uh, those of us in New York would be happy. But if one is going to win, well, good luck to you, my friend. <laughs> thank you very much and thank you for having me I, I sincerely appreciate it uh, I appreciate you coming on and thanks again alright take care you too ciao Bye. well uh, there you have it my friends uh, Mr. Uh, Brent uh, Hawking and I have to say I'm, 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 I kid not uh, about what I said to uh, Brent is if you want a good piece of advice uh, he gave it to you which is that you go through, and again, I mean, I take this, uh, as we like to say in the food business, with a grain of salt. I mean, we're going to do a, 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 a show here about deliciousness, but that doesn't mean we can't have a delicious insight. And what you're hearing from a guy who is uh, excited about what he's doing and successful with it, he's basically saying failure is all part of that process. Uh, and rather than being overwhelmed by it, rather than being uh, subsumed by it, rather than being overcome by it, you go, all right, uh, I'm going to learn from this and now keep moving. So uh, there you have it. Good to um, good to speak with him like that, like that very much. Now, uh, I had promised that we were going to spend some uh, time uh, on uh, food as it relates to the Super Bowl. I found uh, some things, as I uh, often do, 
um, online uh, about the Super Bowl, including, by the way, coming to you from the folks who bring you the Today Show, uh, the most popular Super Bowl foods and recipes in every state, according to Google. So this is what everyone is going to be eating by state in the Super Bowl. And I'm prepared, as much as I'm skeptical about lists, it's coming from the Today Show via Google. I'll take it for what it's worth, but I'm now going to give you state by state These are the foods that are most searched for, for the Super Bowl 2019 that's coming up this Sunday. Are you ready for me? Alabama, they search for (laughs) white chicken chili. Why am I not surprised that Alabama is searching for something white? Okay, white chicken chili out of Alabama. Alaska, you know, Sarah Palin's place. You know what they want over there? They're searching for nachos. Arizona, what would you guess be? What are they looking for in Arizona? And the answer is cake. <laughs> I don't, why? I don't know. Arkansas, fried chicken wings. California, oh yeah, sure, look at you. Baked chicken breast. Can you believe that? That's almost, like, I don't, why anybody would ever search for baked chicken breast? I, I mean, let's face it, of all the different pieces of the chicken, the one that consistently and forever has the least taste is the breast, and the one surefire way to guarantee that it comes out with no taste is to bake it. And here we are in California, the number one search on Google, Super Bowl recipe 2019 baked chicken breast. That's a just a nightmare, considering, by the way, and I forgot to mention this to Brent, that Los Angeles has become easily one of the most highly regarded restaurant cities food cities, you know, in the country, right? And, you you know, you can go up and down California, by the way. I mean, San Francisco, Napa Valley, uh, 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 you know, they're eating some killer great food out there. Sacramento, God bless. Baked chicken breast makes no sense to me. Colorado, okay, let's go back to the thing, which is one of the most searched for food things, recipes uh, for the Super Bowl by state, according to the Today Show, which whose information comes from Google. In Colorado, my friends, they, they want to know how to make <laughs> broccoli cheese soup. Yeah, it's cold over there in Colorado, but not as cold as it is in uh, Wisconsin and, Minis- and Minnesota. Holy crap. Connecticut. Thank you, Connecticut. They want buffalo chicken dip. I like that. Connecticut, one of the kind of underrated um, food locales, uh, especially when it comes to New Haven, Connecticut. If you tuned in last week, my friends, you might have heard me speaking with um, uh, with who? With my friend uh, Dan Myers from the Daily Meal. And one of the things that we talked about was the pizza in New Haven, easily one of the great pizza cities in America. And we also talked about Louis, uh, you know, the hamburger joint over there, using that same vertical machine they've been using for a hundred years. So anyway, Connecticut, good on you. Buffalo chicken dip in Delaware. They want to know how to make chocolate peanut butter cake. Again, with the cake. Cake seems to be very popular. I have never been to a party, a Super Bowl party, where cake was like a big deal. Uh, Washington D.C. wants to know how to make <laughs> bagel pigs in a blanket. I just, honestly, I don't even. Like, I like, um, I like pigs in a blanket. Uh, I didn't know that you could put them in a bagel. In fact, I'm going to tell you, by the way, don't, uh, nobody's here to let, nobody is here. Can somebody remind me to talk about pigs in a blanket? All right, look, I'm going to do it now because we're on it. You ready? Uh, every year for the past, uh, let's say decade, I post a video of myself making pigs in blankets because I have a video of that. I, I, if I could, uh, where could you find that? I suppose if you go to YouTube and you look up, I don't know. Rob Rosenthal, I don't know, pigs in blankets, whatever, you might be able to find me. I make pigs in blankets. I make my own. And in order to make them, by the way, understanding that you're taught, you're, you're, this is a guy who wants the most taste with the fewest ingredients and the least effort. It's kind of lazy food. There, there's only two ingredients required for pigs in blankets, and one of them is going to be the pigs. You could certainly use hot dog if you want. I go to the, uh, the Costco, because as you guys know, I'm the Costco ho. I buy a huge package of kielbasa. 
which are tasty and plump and fabulous. And the thing about kielbasa is when you buy them over there at the Costco, they're already cooked. So all you really want to do is give them a little sear so that they look beautiful and they have a little extra flavor because you've caramelized them. And then you're going to wrap them. Now, you're not going to make your own dough. That's just ridiculous. You buy uh, Pillsbury frozen dough. And you figure out how to roll it out and stuff it up with a giant kielbasa. Cook the whole thing until you look at it and you go, that looks ready because that's brown and yummy. And I know the stuff on the inside's already cooked because it's kielbasa. And then you slice it into bite-sized pieces and you serve it with some honey mustard and you're a hero. Pigs in blankets, make your own two ingredients. You need a recipe. Get in touch with me. Short order dead. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, short order dead at Gmail. I'll send you a recipe. I'll send you the video, whatever you want. Back to uh, top 50 foods requested by state. The state of Florida wants to know how to make cake. I mean, again, what, what? WTF? Who cares? Hey, come to my Super Bowl party. What are you serving? We're going to be having cake. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> really? This just seems so stupid to me. That said, by the way, if I were in Florida, I could tell you what I'd be serving. I'd be serving key lime pie from key limes that come from that state. And if I were in Florida and money were no expense and we're in season, which we are, you know what you would have at my party? You would have stone crabs because stone crabs are a little gift from heaven. I think they're better than lobster. You know, that sweet meat that comes out of that shell. There's a very famous restaurant in Miami. It's called Joe's. It's one of the highest grossing restaurants in America. You go in there for the stone crabs and they serve it with like a I don't want to say honey mustard, but that's what it is. It's kind of like, not honeyish. it's kind of a mustardy mayo. It's just a beautiful kind of little dipping thing. On the side, what are you going to have? I'm going to tell you what I would have if I go to Joe's. Two of the, well, some of the top meals of my life have taken place at Joe's Stone Crab in Miami. I want stone crabs, and I'm going to have it with uh, fried green tomatoes. And uh, that's going to go well with an ice cold uh, beer of some sort. And I'm going to finish off that meal with a piece of key lime a pie and a nice cup of crank, a uh, dark uh, coffee. That meal, oh, man, I, I just I love that meal so much. What are they searching for in Georgia? Buffalo chicken dip. That's twice on this list. People like their buffalo chicken dip. Um, I want to say this, by the way, about... Buffalo and about chicken. I'm going to come to a part of this show if we get to it of the most kind of popular requested foods in America when it comes to, you know, just in total. I mean, people are chicken wing, just bananas. I mean, chicken wings are just showing up everywhere all the time. I feel bad for chickens because all people seem to want this coming Sunday is the wings. And, um, you know, I don't, uh, I'm not getting paid by Franks, but if, 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 or Costco for that matter. But if you want to make anything kind of Buffalo style, you know, get yourself over to Costco and buy some Franks. They sell two giant bottles. You'll have them for about, you know, a year. But it doesn't matter. They're not going bad. And if you want to make something Buffalo style, to be honest with you, you got to get Franks hot sauce. That's what they're using up in Buffalo. I don't know how to make buffalo chicken dip because, frankly, if I'm making anything with buffalo and chicken, it's going to be buffalo chicken wings. You can make buffalo. You can make buffalo cauliflower. That would be good. And in the case of the chicken wings, by the way, you know you could fry them or you could uh, throw them in the oven on a sheet and put it on high heat until the fire alarm goes off, and then they're all crispy and beautiful. And then all you have to do is take like half franks, half butter, and Toss your wings in that. You got buffalo chicken wings. How hard is that? Cut up some celery. Buy some, uh, you know, blue cheese dressing. It's a good party. Now, here's the upgrade. I'm asking you to think about this. Forget the chicken wings. Go with turkey wings. I just want to make the point that a turkey wing is a chicken wing on super steroids. I mean, it's just, you know, it's 10 times the size. It's got a lot more meat. But you throw that into the oven long enough, and that skin, man, gets dark and crispy. You don't have to put a ton on it. You know, you want to hit it up with some Franks. You can. 
You want to put it on some salt and pepper, you could, right? You want to hit up your wings with any of your favorite seasonings. Hey, uh, Rob, I like Italian seasoning. Fine, put on some red pepper flakes and oregano, maybe some garlic salt. Throw those into the oven and cook the heck out of that until they're all brown and fantastic. Then take them out and toss them around in a combo of butter and franks. That's a that's a turkey. That's a buffalo turkey wing. That's just invite me over. I'm ha- I swear to you, it's all I I would if I go to a party and all they're serving is buffalo turkey wings. Count me in. And I'll tell you something else too. It doesn't have to be Italian. Uh, you want um? I want to make um um. I like <clears throat> I like Southwest flavors. All right, buy turkey wings, meaty, delicious and cheap. And hit them up with some salt. Hit them up with some, uh, hit them up with some ancho chili powder. Hit them up with some smoked paprika, otherwise known as pimenton. They have a smoky flavor. They have the ancho chili flavor. They have the salt on them. They're good on their own, but you could still toss them with your franks and butter. Buffalo turkey wings. Hello. In Florida, what are they searching for? Football cupcakes. In Idaho, and I confess that this surprises me because all I'm assuming, I guess they don't have to look up uh, potato recipes in Idaho, so they're looking up salads. Honestly, I don't even know. Like, really? Rob, um, Super Super Bowl party, uh, we're going to be serving salads. <laughs> you know what? I'm, I'm busy. I'm actually going in for a root canal work. What, what, uh, what kind of salad are you going to serve? I'm going to want to come to your party. Well, we have a chef salad. No, nah, I'm fine. We're going to do something with arugula. No, nope, I'm fine. I'm good. What? What? What's your favorite? I have a lot of salads I like. I don't want a salad on a Super Bowl party. I want wings. I want turkey wings. I want potato skins that are stuffed. Salads in Idaho. In Illinois, they're looking for jalapeno poppers. Fine. Indiana wants... (laughs) I would not have guessed this. Indiana wants to go a little uh, exotic. Number one search in Indiana for Super Bowl food recipe, fried rice. Now... I'm guessing, tell me if I'm wrong, guessing that uh, if they're looking for fried rice in Indiana, are they really looking because they're going to make it? Or are they looking for like the local Chinese restaurant to deliver? I don't know, really. Idaho. Idaho wants to, uh, is searching for Irish stew, whatever that is. Kansas. Kansas wants buffalo chicken dip. Very popular tonight. Kentucky. <laughs> well, excuse me. What do they want in Kentucky? Taco salad. So they're going, you know, we like tacos, but we don't want to go overboard, so we're going to make a taco salad. Now, that's a party I would consider, especially because, you know, they're going to be serving bourbon. Louisiana. Again, Louisiana is searching for cupcakes. When are they watching like a, a America's Next Baking Championship down there in Louisiana? I don't understand. Like, uh, who's making cupcakes for the Super Bowl? Uh, maybe okay. Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm just being stupid. Maybe cupcakes is the thing you bring to somebody else's house, especially if they have kids. You put a picture of a football on it. New Orleans, Louisiana, my friends, easily one of the three, four, maybe two greatest food cities in America. They're looking for cupcakes at a place where they're making uh, muffalettas, fried chicken, po' boys, oysters, uh, gumbo. And you know what kind of recipes, uh, you know what kind of food they're looking for in Louisiana for the Super Bowl? They're looking for, um, they're looking for cupcakes. Now, maybe these are sad cupcakes given the called against the Saints uh, uh, two weeks ago. Maybe these are just cupcakes with tears in them. I understand that. Now, we're going to go up to Maine. And this, again, is going to surprise the hell out of you because people are going against type. I think Maine, I think of Maine as being like a very white uh, kind of place. Like white, like a lot of white. You know what they're looking for up in Maine? They want to know the recipe to make paella. That impresses me. Hello, Maine. Your independence is respected. Paella is a great, great dish, a beautiful choice up there in Maine. I know you're going to be rooting for the Patriots because they're like a neighboring kind of town. And you're going to be, and if I get invited to a party in Maine, I'm telling you right now, folks, 
Get in touch with me. You're up there in uh, in in Portland or in Bangor. I love Portland. Oh, <clears throat> Portland, Maine. Uh, probably, arguably, uh, the best kind of small food city in America. Can't get over what goes on in Portland, Maine. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. They want to make a paella. And what I'm going to say is the following. If I'm invited to a party for Super Bowl in Maine, and on the, uh, you know, and on the menu is paella, count me in. The only thing I would like to say, and I want everybody to know it, is, um, does anybody know the best part of the paella? And you're going to go, well, you know, some people could say the rice. Some people could say the seafood if you're making a seafood paella. Although you could also make a different kind of paella, right? There's the seafood, that's the, um, um, uh, what is it, marinera, right? And then there's the uh, uh, paella valenciana. That's the one that has, like, the chicken and sausage. Either way, I'll tell you what the best part is. It's not just the rice in general. It's the crispy rice that is stuck to the bottom of the paella pan. Otherwise known, here's your trivia for this evening, and if there's a test later, remember this. It's called a Saccharat, S-O-C-C-A-R-A-T, Saccharat. There's actually a name for the crispy rice at the bottom of the paella pan, the Saccharat. So if anybody's having a party up in Maine and you want to invite me, uh, 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 and, and you're serving paella, and you have the Saccharat, uh, I'll bring the... I'll bring the Sam Smiths or the Sam Adams or whatever the local, you know, brew is up in that part of the world. Maryland, looking for pizza, fine. By the way, um, I'm a guy who, those of you who know, know that I spent about uh, a lot of time traveling around the world uh, for, for, for work and for business. I've Eaten at well over 3,000 restaurants on, on six continents with the exception of Antarctica. Antarctica. I'm a guy with a, a professional culinary uh, degree and uh, uh, literally thousands of hours of training and, 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 and cooking. My, that being said, my number one food in the world is pizza. Pizza, number one for me. So when I see that Maryland is looking for pizza, I can't put that down. And I will say this when it comes to pizza. Um, in the, the Super Bowl, I mean, you know how many people are going to be ordering in pizza? That goes without saying. Here, here, here's what I want to promote as a guy who is very pro, you know, do it yourself. Homemade, home style, home cooking. You don't have to make a dough from scratch because that actually, uh, you know, takes worth and w- work and some modicum of uh, know how and talent. But I'll tell you what you can do when it comes to pizza. You can go out and buy some uh, mozzarella cheese. And like with anything else in life, get the best mozzarella cheese you can. And I, and I would say given the choice between pre, you know, cut, pre-shredded and a nice you know, so so the 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 pre-cut mozzarella, let's put it that on w- one end of the scale, and on the absolute complete opposite end is someone has made at your local gourmet Italian market, homemade Mozzarella cheese. All right, so anywhere in that spectrum is okay. Here's the point I want to make. You're not going to make your own dough. That actually takes work and some know-how. But, but you can go to the supermarket, I believe, and you can buy some um, pizza dough, frozen sometimes, and you let it defrost. You can go, and I've done this, if you live in the kind of place that has, you know, pizza places. I mean, I... I guess I do here in New York. I I know that I can go in and buy a pizza dough versus the whole pizza, right? And make that. And I know that you can go to the supermarket even if they don't have like dough dough. You know, you can buy one of those kind of uh, crust things. Anyway, I'm just proposing here that you can make your own pizza because all you really need is cheese and some decent tomato sauce and buy the bread. And then you go, oh, what am I going to do with this dough? And the answer is you, 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 Get a pan that you can, that you can flat, you know, you can kind of flatten it out and put it in. Anyway, all right, look, I've made my point. Massachusetts, this is the most ridiculous. Okay, of all of them so far, this is stupid number one. That the number one search in Massachusetts, the very place where their, their team is playing in, what is it, like the 99th Super Bowl in a row. And here's the number one. I can't even, you can't even make this up. Here's the number one search food item in Massachusetts 2019 Super Bowl. 
gluten-free pretzels. What? Are you got to be kidding me? What is it like the uh the the heartland of uh of uh of gluten-free? What do you say? I know it, it's a uh, I look, I'm not putting anybody down that has any eating problem here. But gluten-free pretzels is what they're looking for in Massachusetts for the Super Bowl. I mean, I'd be damn, I if I'm in Massachusetts, by the way, my team is playing. I'll tell you what I would have. This is going to sound this is going to sound strange, but this is my truth, right? Most taste, views, and ingredients, least effort, lazy. Theory of cooking, get the best ingredients you can. Don't mess them up too much. I'm going to tell you what I would serve. You're coming to my place, right? I'm going to have some... Um, I'm going to have some gin in the house, and I'm going to have some vodka, and I'm going to have some De Leon original tequila, right? Like, you know, we're adults. It's a party night. Uh, sure, you want to have cold beer? Fine. I'll have some wine if you want to have that. I don't want to discriminate. And, uh, you know, as far as what I'm going to serve, if I'm really super ambitious, I'll throw the turkey wings in the oven because... They're just so, so good. So, so good. Easy. I mean, if all you do, to be honest with you, is kind of like, you know, salt and pepper, <laughs> put those in the oven at a high heat for a while, they're, they're just it's just good eating, right? Because it's like the dark meat, crispy skin. It's just yummy. And you can always throw on your favorite, you know, spices or whatever. Like you want to make it spicy, it's easy, right? Because you can throw on some cayenne pepper. Right, you want to make it, oh, you know, I like a little Asian. Fine, so you give it a little soy, soy sauce. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be serving, you know, chips, but I, I, and I have a problem with chips. I have an addiction uh, to the um, the tortilla chips, like good tortilla chips, if they were served with salsa. Honestly, uh, th- that's the kind of thing that I can't stop. That You know, I have a compulsion with that. I've said it before, I'll say it again, if there was a 12-step program for like chips and salsa, hello, my name is Rob. Which reminds me, by the way, if I saw good chips, and I'm not talking about the, you know, like the the usual garbage ones, I really think that there are better tortillas to chips out there and you can get them. And um, salsa actually takes a little bit of work to make, so you, you, if you can buy a decent one, I don't love the ones in the jar, but I'll tell you what I, I make. If, if you can get your hands on some ripe avocados, by the way, I would buy them now if they're not ripe. Today, Wednesday, they'll be ripe by Sunday if they're hard now. But, um, yeah, because I like the chips and, um, and, and, and I, I love homemade guacamole. Do you want to know exactly how to make that? Here, get, grab a, grab a pad and, and a pen because I make not only do I make great guacamole, uh, and I'm not patting myself on the back. It doesn't, you know, you don't have to be gifted to do this. But there's a recipe for guacamole in my cookbook, Short Order Dead, One Guy's Guide to Making Food Fun and Hassle Free. You can get it on Amazon, Walmart, Barnes & Noble, Short Order Dead. You'll see my guacamole recipe, but here's what I want to tell you. It's not just like Rob uh, from New York telling you how to make guacamole. I went to the source. The same way that my man uh, Brent, he wanted to find out about tequila, he goes down to Jalisco and he's like interviewing people because that's where they make the stuff. I got the recipe from guacamole for uh, from uh, Betty. Forget uh, Chef uh, Betty's last name. Betty, 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 Betty. Mexican chef of, of such a prodigious uh, talent that when they run uh, the show down there, whatever the... Sh- one of those cooking competitions, uh, top chef. Yeah, she's gonna, she's one of the judges. She made me a guacamole. I ate it. It was extraordinary. And I believe I said to her, what's the recipe? And she told me precisely what it was, which I'll repeat to you because it's not complicated. And I suppose I might have actually said to her at that point in her restaurant, somewhere in the middle of Mexico, uh, any, uh, do you ever use a tomato? And she said, no. I like, she literally unhesitatingly says to me, no. Why? I say. And she said, because guacamole is a celebration of the avocado. You see, everything that you do, everything that you include with it is meant to enhance the natural wonder 
just the the beautiful, soft, earthy, sweet, uh, deep uh, umami of the avocado, and then tomato, uh, due to its uh, uh, liquidity and its acidity, is a detraction uh, from uh, guacamole. So the most important ingredient now, I think you know, goes without saying, is ripe avocados. Rob, how do I know if they're ripe? Well, if they're hard as a rock, they're not. If they're too soft, don't take them. But there's a point, and it's closer to soft than hard, when you can um, when you can uh, push your finger into the avocado and it yields a little bit, and you go, "Hmm, I see," said me. Yeah, take those avocados home. You're going to need a, a little bit of uh, red onion. Like if you buy an entire red onion, I swear to you, you're going to use one eighth of it. Finely, finely chopped. That goes in a bowl. What's what's an eighth of an onion? It's a tablespoon or 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 two, right? And then you're going to want to have a little um, uh, uh, heat, which uh, it comes from a hot uh, pepper. Most people use jalapeno, which is perfectly acceptable. However, if serrano is available, I propose you go with one of those instead. You want it hot, you cut up that serrano finely and leave all the seeds in it. You want it not so hot, you remove the seeds because, my friends, that is where the heat is from. Now we have in a bowl a little bit of chopped, uh, finely chopped uh, red onion. We have a little bit of, uh, what do you call it, like an entire serrano or two. You don't have to add it all in at once, right? Just put in one, finely chopped. Uh, here's where you can go optional, and it's on the garlic. You can take it either way. You don't certainly have to. Uh, you could argue against it. I, I put the tiny, like a half a clove or a clove, depending on how many avocados I'm using. A little bit of flavor of garlic will not hurt you. Cut the avocados lengthwise. Take out the pit, which comes out easily. Scoop the avocado into the bowl with the onion and with the... Uh, the uh, jalapeno and uh, garlic or not, if you so desire. Now start to mash. How much mash? I don't want it to be too mashed. It's not baby food. It should have some texture to it. You could mash it with a fork, or uh, 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 alternatively, you could mash it with a potato uh, a potato masher, you know, the things that you make mashed potato with. And, 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 and again, don't kill it. Just mash it down so that we're blending together ingredients. Now, we're going to flavor this thing. The seasonings are the following. Salt. Plenty. Kosher. All right? You don't have to put it all in at once, but you're going to start with enough. Let's say you have three avocados in that bowl, right? You're going to put in a decent hit of salt or two. You'll taste it afterwards to go, oh, maybe it needs more, maybe it doesn't. Now, at this point, we're going to put in some lime juice. How much? Again, same deal. Half a lime squeezed, a whole lime squeezed, depending, again, on your taste and and, and on how much excuse me, on how much, uh, how many avocado you have in there. And the final ingredient, and I'm telling you, again, for me, it's not guacamole with, with, without uh, uh, cilantro, fresh, finely uh, chopped or shredded by hand. I know that there are people that have a genetic anti-disposition to cilantro. Sorry, because my guacamole has cilantro in it. I, I, uh, but anyway, you know, of course I could make some without. And then you, you just mix all those things together and you taste it and you go, that is flawless. It is perfect. It is the greatest uh, guacamole I've ever had. Or you go, you know what? It needs a hit more salt. Uh, I could actually give it a little bit more of that spice. So maybe I have a little bit more of the, uh, you know, the serrano with the jalapeno chopped up, or maybe it wants a little bit more lime, or, oh, you got people that love cilantro? Go ahead, put more of that. And there you have it. That's how you make your own guacamole. Always, universally, with 100% of the time and no exception, better than any other, any guacamole that you can buy. Uh, yeah, that took some time. So here's the other thing I was going to tell you about what would happen at my party. We have some guacamole. We have chips. There's gin, vodka, uh, tequila, uh, wine, and, and beer. Because I'm not rooting for either one of these teams. I'm rooting for like a good cocktail and some nice snacks, right? We're going to have guacamole. You know how to make it. We're going to have turkey wings. You know how to make them. And we're going to have cheese. And you know what kind of cheese we're going to have? 
We're going to have cheese called Parmigiano Reggiano, also known as Italy's perfect food. It comes in giant wheels. And when you buy it, maybe you're buying a, a, a bit of it, like a, a section of it. It's not inexpensive for cheese, but it is the king of cheese. It is one of the greatest cheeses that there is, not just to grate on your pasta, sure, not just to grate into a thousand other things that you, that you could, you know, that you could make, um, but um, it's just great in its own right. In other words, it's it's great to have little chunks of Parmesan Reggiano, which, uh, by the way, even at Costco, when you buy a wheel of the stuff, now a wheel, again, a wheel is going to have, I don't know, hundreds of hundreds of portions, it's still 900, 1,000 bucks for a wheel. But what a great cheese. And it's a cheese, incidentally, that's not only great from a taste perspective, um, it's also great from a health perspective. I want to see if I can find uh, before the one minute that we have left. Well, if you look it up, I think there's, it's got like more protein than steak and more calcium than, uh, oh, here we go. Yeah. Uh, eight, eight, nine grams of pro, uh, protein is more than beef. Uh, 320 milligrams of calcium, 10 times more than milk, magnesium, potassium. Ladies and gentlemen, Parmesan Reziano, the king of cheese. We're going to have that at my party and the wings and the guacamole, and all you can drink. This coming Sunday night, Super Bowl Sunday, whoever you root for. This is Rob Rosenthal coming to you on Wednesday nights, just around 8.03 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, generally live, as I am right now from New York City, New York. By my cookbook, you can still get it in time for the game. Short order, Dad, that's what it's called. And remember this, my friend. Life is short. Never waste a meal. See you next week.